Hello, I'm Alan Handyside, Honorary Professor of Reproductive Genetics in the School of Biosciences at the University of Kent, Canterbury, in the UK. I'm pleased and honoured to guest edit this special issue of reproduction to mark the 30th anniversary of the landmark report in Nature in April 1990 by a team led by myself and Professor Lord Robert Winston of the first pregnancies and subsequently in July of the first live births following IVF, embryo biopsy and genetic testing for inherited disease at Hammersmith Hospital in London. Looking back on those early pioneering days, it is remarkable what we were able to achieve at a time when human genetics and single cell genetic testing were still in their infancy. The genetic defects uh, responsible for only a handful of inherited diseases were known then, uh, notably Huntingdon disease and cystic fibrosis being two of the earliest examples. And the sequencing of the genome the human genome, which we now take for granted, would not be completed for another 10 to 15 years. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, which was essential to amplify the DNA of single or small numbers of cells for genetic testing, was still unreliable and involved standing over two water baths, one set at near boiling temp denaturing temperature and the other at the annealing temperature with a timer in one hand and moving a polystyrene raft with the PCR tubes from one uh, water bath to the next every couple of minutes for each thermal cycle of the PCR reaction, often uh, lasting for over two hours. There were also challenges for me personally. I performed all of the early cleavage stage embryo biopsies for the clinical cases. However, because I was not a trained embry clinical embryologist, I was not allowed to work in the busy IVF lab and use their incubators and micromanipulators. Indeed, having been trained to nurture IVF embryos and minimize handling out of the incubator, the IVF team were very concerned about the potential for damaging the embryos by removing cells. So it was necessary to set up a second culture and biopsy lab in a temporary hut erected in the 1960s and squeezed in between the end of the hospital and the infamous Wormwood Scrubs next, uh, prison next door. This meant that I had to place the petri dish with the patient's embryos in drops of culture medium under a layer of oil in a plastic box and carry them with great care down the length of a busy hospital corridor to the biopsy lab, a practice that I would not recommend and which would not be contemplated or allowed today. I was, however, fortunate under the circumstances to have inherited a micromanipulator purchased for another research project, which I was able to adapt for embryo biopsy. I made all the pipettes by hand at that time, including pulling the glass capillaries, flame polishing the tips, and putting bends at the end of the pipette over a small ethanol burner, a practice which I'd learned from Met for many years working with mouse embryos. I would then, uh, starting at eight o'clock in the morning on the third day post insemination, I would biopsy each embryo using a mouth pipette, again, which would not be allowed nowadays, by drilling a hole in the zona pellucida with acidified tyroid solution, and then switch to a second larger biopsy micro pipette filled with medium to gently aspirate a single cell from embryos, ideally at the six to 10 cell stage. At that time, I believed that decompacting the embryos with calcium magnesium free medium, um, which was very effective with mouse embryos, might actually damage them in the longer term. So the process of gently extracting each cell without lysing it often took up to 15 minutes, which would not be acceptable today, particularly as I was doing this at room temperature. In fact, because I didn't have access to a heated stage 
and because embryo culture media were less optimal then. Most embryos were not compact, perhaps for obvious reasons. Finally, when all of the embryos had been biopsied, they were returned to the clinical lab in the same way that they arrived. Another perilous journey down, back down the hospital corridor. Back in the lab, uh, in the genetics lab, there was then a frantic effort to begin the PCR amplification process and later to perform gel electrophoresis to look at the products of PCR products, the amplified products, in, in uh, a very brief period of time to identify the unaffected embryos because it was essential to transfer them later on the same day, day three, if possible. So one of the reasons for focusing on cleavage stage biopsy at that um, stage was that um, culture of embryos to the blastocyst stage was certainly possible, but clinical pregnancy rates after transferring blastocysts in the media that were then being used were actually very low. And so it wasn't a practical possibility and every effort therefore was made to perform the biopsy and the genetic analysis in a single day so that the transfer could go ahead. But of course, sometimes those transfers would be quite late in the day, perhaps eight or nine o'clock or even later on day three. By the summer of 1989, we demonstrated that cleavage stage biopsy did not compromise the ability of embryos to develop to the blastocyst stage and were ready to begin the first treatment cycles for what was then known as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD. And now quite recently, um, the terminology has been changed. So we now refer to this as pre-implantation genetic testing or PGT. And for single gene defects, we now call it PGT for monogenic disease or PGTM. Our aim was to treat a series of couples at risk of various X-linked conditions. And at that time, some several hundred of them had been described, which were known to be sex-linked or X-linked conditions. These include diseases like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, adrenal leukodystrophy, dystrophy, and X-linked pancreatic retardation. And many of these are quite severe uh, or childhood lethal conditions. These conditions, because they involve genes on the X chromosomes, uh, typically only affect boys who inherit the defective gene from their unaffected carrier mothers. We therefore developed a PCR protocol to amplify a Y chromosome specific repeat sequence from single cells to identify male embryos, half of which on average would be affected by the condition uh, because they had inherited the the gene defect on the particular X chromosome from their mothers. And then to select only female embryos for transfer. But of course, half of those would be unaffected carriers because we weren't at that stage able to actually directly detect the genetic defect underlying the disease. The first treatment cycle and transfer then went ahead late in the summer of 1989. There was some concern that the size of the holes in the protective zona pellucida of the two embryos which were transferred could lead to, quote, the baby falling out of the pram, as Robert put it, since in the mouse, zona free cleavage stage embryos do not survive in the uterus. Sadly, however, it was um, so there was relief and delight when the pregnancy test for that first cycle was positive. Sadly, however, it was only a biochemical pregnancy, but the couple were successful in their second attempt. And in July, 1990, twin baby girls were born following the earlier transfer of two biopsied embryos. Overall, five out of eight of this first series of patients became pregnant and the ongoing pregnancy and delivery rate Per embryo transferred was 32%, a remarkable achievement given the perambulations the embryos were subjected to along the hospital corridors 
Pregnancy and live birth rates following IVF have improved dramatically over the last 30 years since those early attempts at pre-implantation genetic testing. And together with advances in our understanding of human genetics and genomics and technological advances, uh, we're now able to accurately perform testing of the early embryo, not only for monogenic diseases, but also a range of chromosomal abnormalities and other applications. And even recently, as you will see in this special issue of um, reproduction, we're able to do polygenic risk scoring for common multifactorial diseases like diabetes, something that we didn't think would be practically possible given the small numbers of human eggs and embryos that we have access to in individual cycles. It is humbling to contemplate that what Robert and I and our team achieved all those years ago is still considered by many couples to be a valuable option, enabling them to start a pregnancy knowing it is unaffected from the, from the beginning, and that thousands of children have now been born worldwide free of inherited disease. I'm enormously grateful to my colleagues who have been responsible for many of the recent advances in pre-implantation genetic testing and in non-invasive prenatal testing for agreeing to contribute to the special issue of reproduction. And I apologize to all those other colleagues who I could not invite because of space limitations. It is clear from these articles that pre-implantation genetics has an exciting future and I hope you find them as stimulating and informative as I did. Thank you.